Amen. All right, you may be seated. Well, once again, good evening. I'm glad to be with you and feeling good and all those things. So if you have your Bibles, let's go ahead and turn them to 1 Samuel chapter 7. Uh, if you're newer to this church, then you understand that if you don't have a Bible, we encourage you to get a Bible. And I know that some of us have, uh, you know, it on our phones and things like that. I, that's a great resource. But I always want to encourage you to get your own Bible so you can write your own commentary and your own notes in it. And uh, it's just kind of an interesting thing to see sometimes these notes that you wrote into your Bible years ago, you can go back and look at it and see where you are today. And oftentimes, God has answered so many of those questions or so many of those things. So it's just an awesome way to log what God is doing in your own life. So I encourage you to do that. Now, we have been going through 1 Samuel, and we looked uh, in the last little while as the Philistines who had captured the ark from the children of Israel had finally put action into returning it. They weren't returning it because they were just very nice people and that's just what they wanted to do. No, they were returning it because there were seven months of tumors, rats, and God's heads and hands were falling off. And so they said, yeah, we should probably find a way to go ahead and return this back to the people we stole it from. So last week we looked as they sought the diviners and the priests, the best that money could possibly come up with, the best resources that they could ever have. And the answer they came up with from the diviners, from the priests that they could find was you should do this. Do five images of the tumors in gold. And remember what I said, that these tumors were not like the cancerous tumors that we would picture today on someone, but these were more of like a hemorrhoid type uh, bum tumor, <laughs> bum tumor uh, an, am an anus tumor, and they made a statue of gold out of this, let your mind run wild, uh, five of them. Then they made five images of rats in gold. Uh, and apparently this is what they thought the Lord would want to say. You know what, guys? I'm just kind of sorry. You know, Lord, I'm sorry. Have these beautiful art that we made for you. Uh, but before they returned the ark, they just had to be sure, right? That's the way we kind of ended off. They had this idea uh, that the, the diviners also wanted to see. And it was just so hard to surrender this ark, this, this great deal of victory, this pagan god. Th these people were pagan and godless. And they, they thought they, all these gods are the same. But yet this, this, <laughs> the presence of the Lord, this, this ark that they had taken that they thought was just another god was destroying all their other gods. So they didn't quite want to give it up. But at the same time, it was really causing quite the havoc. So the idea was what we should do is we should hitch up these two cows that have never been yoked before. Uh, we should separate them from their calves and then let the calves go free. And if the cows decide to return to where they should go, which is in Beth Shemesh, if they go back, then the God of Israel has surely done all this. And if the cows return back to their calves, which are over here, which would, uh, cows have a very strong motherly instinct, which any normal cow would go back to their cows, uh, then it happened by chance. I think it's hilarious that they tried stacking the odds against God and were like, all right, if this is really you, God, you know, we're going to stack all the odds against you. And as soon as those cows were released, uh, you know, those, those cows really started moving I see you, Adam. So it was funny. When I said this last week, Adam's like, I couldn't believe it, bro. You sat up there, and you're like the guy that's always giving dad jokes through your whole messages. And he's like, and you missed one. I said, what? He's like, those cows really got moving. I was like, you are a dad too. Yeah. So uh, anyways, but they got going fast. I mean, they ended up taking off. They didn't look one way or the other. They just continued on directly for the destination of Beth Shemesh, which would tell them that most definitely the Lord was the one who did it to you. And the whole time it was going, they were lowing all the way because they were so torn by the fact that they probably in their mind wanted to go back to the calves but they couldn't, and so they were having this torment as they were running towards their destination. God's power was on display, not to answer the Philistines, but to put his power on display. God will do that often, guys. And I think it's strange that people can see the power of God. 
People can hear about what the Lord has done in their lives, but yet, like the Philistines, refuse to surrender their lives to that God after they see the great handiwork all around them. You would think if people could just see what I see, it's like sometimes they see it and they just completely turn the other way. And we ended on the people of Beth Shemesh looking and almost stranger than the cows running into Beth Shemesh would be the people that were working out in the field. Then all of a sudden, the thing that is the most holy thing for the children of Israel all of a sudden just rolls in being pulled by two carts. You know, it's like, are you serious? You can't paint this story. They're out working in the field and the thing they thought was gone forever has now just come right back into town and they begin to handle it and they begin to look into it and they begin to die. There was a very great slaughter and what is sad is as it came back in, there should have been an excitement because the Lord quite literally won the battle himself, brought it back and dropped it before them. But there should have been a reverence for, that, for, for, for God that they, that they didn't handle it, that they did the appropriate things, but instead they're handling it, they're opening it. And it was almost sad to me as I looked as the Philistines almost had more reverence for the Lord than even his own people did. They had more reverence on the level of let me seek out whatever we can do. Let's find the best that money could buy. Even though it was wrong, they still had the heart to do the best that they possibly could do. Meanwhile, the ark strolls back in and the people just began to handle it and open it. You know, and we ended with something very tragic. And this is, this is how we ended the whole service was instead of humbling themselves, the children of Israel, as they, as they, as they've done this thing. And, and drawing closer to the Lord and asking for repentance and blessing again, they just wanted the ark gone. The same way that the Philistines just wanted the ark gone, instead of submitting their lives to the Lord, they just wanted it gone and out of their lives. And again, just like the Philistines, here, here we are. So many times the Lord will put something on display in our lives and say, this isn't right. And we just want to put God away. We just want to put him out of our lives. And church, that, that's a scary spot to be in as we're going to see again tonight. So the covenant was kind of making its rounds and we'll see where it lies today. So let's go ahead and read chapter seven, starting in verse one, and we'll go to verse six. So it says, Then the men of kirjath Jerem came and took the ark of the Lord and brought it into the house of Abinadab on the hill that consecrated Elzir, his son, to keep the ark of the Lord. So it was, the ark remained with Kirjath Jerem a long time. It was there 20 years, and all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. Then Samuel spoke to all the house of Israel, saying, If you return to the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the foreign gods and the asterisks from among you, and prepare your hearts for the Lord, and serve him only, and he will deliver you from the hand of the Philistines." So the children of Israel put away the Baals, the asterisks, and served the Lord only. And Samuel said, gather all Israel to Mitzpah, and I will pray to the Lord for you. So they gathered together at Mitzpah, drew water, poured it out before the Lord, and they fasted that day and said there, we have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the children of Israel at Mitzpah. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. Father, we just pray that as we begin to just look at these verses, Lord God, that you would just uh, begin to work in our hearts, Lord. It, it was so amazing, the, the worship uh, that we had before, Lord, that's just preparing our hearts for whatever you're going to do, Lord, softening us. And, and, and Lord, we just pray, Lord, that you would come and, and just do a great work. Lord, we're doing things tonight uh, in a way that we're going to get over a little bit earlier Lord, that you may do some real work on our hearts personally. Lord, that's what we want, Father. We all showed up to to learn, grow, be comforted, convicted, exhorted. Lord, all those things that your Holy Spirit does. So Holy Spirit, would you just move in this room in a mighty way? Lord, let no one in this room deny, Lord God, what they have felt and seen and heard, that there is power in the name of Jesus Christ. So Lord, you receive the glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's look at verses one through two as that's just kind of the first spot we're gonna spend some time. 
It says, Then the men of Kirjash Jerem came and took the ark of the Lord and brought it into the house of Abinadab on the hill and consecrated Eliezer, his son, to keep the ark of the Lord. So it was that the ark remained in Kirjash Jerem a long time. It was there 20 years. And all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. So this ark does leave the place, Beth Shemesh. It does leave. Uh, instead of trying to just humble yourself before the Lord, uh, it's, it's being pot- passed around like a hot potato. No one's really wanting it. And so they send it to Kirjath Jerem. And there we meet Eliezer. And God is help. God is power is his name. That's literally what his name means. And so we meet this man, and we don't really know much about him before this point. And it says that he was consecrated, which means he is set apart as the one that's going to keep the ark. And you have to assume by this time that they've done things right. You have to assume that he's from the priestly line because the minute he touched it, he didn't die. So that's a good start, right? That's better than the one they had before. We saw what happened in Beth Shemesh. But again, I just want you to notice something that God had a plan for someone that just kind of appeared out of nowhere. We didn't know much about him until he had this job, right? And he was to be set apart for a purpose. And he didn't just set himself apart at the time. I believe that he was setting himself apart for a long time. I believe the Lord had a plan to do something great in his life, but he was setting himself apart to be willing and ready and able to do whatever the Lord wanted him to do. And just as maybe he thought, oh man, Lord, what are you doing? Here comes the Ark of the Covenant against all odds, strolling into his town. And it's like, yeah, you're going to be the one that takes care of this. Maybe the Lord has something for you. Maybe, actually, I'll tell you the Lord has something for you, but are you preparing your hearts and consecrating yourself, setting yourself apart in holiness and righteousness in the Lord and being ready to do the work of the ministry, the work of the gospel, whatever that is, the work of ministering to a friend? Or when the part comes, you're like, well, now I'm going to clean up my life. Now I'm going to spend some time with the Lord. Now I'm going to, no, we should be ready before. We should be ready, Lord, whatever your will is, whatever your way is, that's what we want. And we see that, you know, you're like, well, why didn't it return back to Shiloh from which it came? Well, because Shiloh was probably destroyed in the battle, right? Plus, uh, it had Eli that died there. He fell over and broke his neck. And his sons were horrible people. I, not my words, the Bibles. So, you know, his sons were horrible people. So now we kind of have it looking, Eliezer, looking after it for 20 years. For 20 years, they just kind of hit it like fireworks, And you're like, what does hiding it like fireworks mean? When I was a young kid, whenever I bought fireworks, I had fireworks that my parents didn't know that I had stashed all over the vents of our house. I mean, because all you got to do is pull off the heating vent and then just stick it down in there. And I, we're lucky my house didn't explode because the amount of fireworks I had inside that house, I would hide them all over the place. And that's what they're doing with the ark for 20 years, putting it in the attic, putting it away. Let's just out of sight, out of mind. As long as it's not killing people, we're all good. Man, that is how our relationship with the Lord looks like for a lot of us. For years, you've known the Lord. For years, you know you can approach the Lord. For years, there's a way for you to speak to him. For years, there's a way for you to draw close to him. And instead of drawing close to him, we're just kind of like, yeah, we're just putting him in the attic. I mean, he's our God, but he's just kind of there. Instead of praying and seeking a solution to the problem that's coming or repentance of your own heart so that you can walk closer to him or asking for strength or all those things, we have a tendency to be just like the children of Israel and complain about every single problem that comes our direction. Instead of really seeking the Lord's will for our life, we would rather lament about things that we can't change from our past. John 10, 10, Jesus had this to say. He said, I have come that they may have life and that more abundantly. Jesus didn't come for you to just sit there with your burdens your whole life and carry them around like a big backpack and just feel weighted down all the time. Now, it doesn't mean you're not going to run into these hard times. It doesn't mean that you're not going to run into the trials and the storms of life that every pastor talks about. Problems and trials are going to come. It's part of life. But Philippians 4, 6 through 7 says, be anxious for nothing. I've read this verse all the time, but it's a good reminder. 
But in everything in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. And I think it's important to understand that if you want peace in your life, draw near to Jesus. Don't just kind of put him up on a shelf when you have hard times. Be with him at all times. So we see that Samuel... Praise the Lord for Samuel. Samuel's got a backbone. We're going to see what Samuel does. As he sees this lamenting for 20 years, it says in verse 3, it says, Then Samuel spoke to all the house of Israel, saying, If you return to the Lord with all your hearts, then put away your foreign gods and the asterisks from among you, and prepare, for your, uh, and prepare your hearts for the Lord, and you serve him only. He will deliver you from the hand of the Philistines. Samuel is a much needed and bold person in a time where no one is being very bold. Amen. Samuel's like, all right, everyone is just sitting here crying. There's nothing changing. Why don't you do something about it? Pastor Adam just delivered such a great message on Wednesday. I'm telling you, I love the way he teaches, and I'll tell you why. Because not only does he teach well, but he teaches well when I call him at 9 or 10 a.m. and say, hey, I'm not going to be able to make it today because I'm feeling really ill. And it's never like, oh, bro, like I can't do it. Like I don't have a message. He's like, oh, yeah, it's fine. And he delivered a message as I listened to it through Acts 4, just talking about being bold to to preach the spirit, uh, to to preach the gospel, to tell people about the Lord, to tell people about the truth. And that's exactly what you're seeing from Samuel. A bunch of people complaining about their problems. And he stands up and he begins to paint the picture about how pathetic they are. And you're like, whoa, this this is kind of mean. But this is what he does. He points out four things within just him saying this sentence that we didn't really know a whole lot about. But boy, it paints a picture of their culture, doesn't it? The first thing he paints a picture of was they're not serving the Lord with their whole heart. You've kind of just put God away. You've kind of just hit him up here in the attic. You're kind of just doing your thing. You're not serving the Lord the way you should be. And not only that, the second thing, you've got all sorts of other things that you've been devoting your life to. You've been having foreign gods all over the place. He begins to talk about the common names for gods in Canaan. I mean, you've got all sorts of them. And then he begins to take it and divinely like, you know, hit it on the head. Things that he's seen, the asterisks, which would have been Canaanite goddesses that would have been about sexuality and war and fertility. And they begin to worship that plus the true living God. Their priorities in life were so mixed up, church, that they began to just worship anything because they were miserable. Anything that would come down the path that could give them a quick fix or a quick feeling like if they only worship this God enough, then surely their land would be restored. If they could only do this enough and add this to their religion, uh, their, their relationship with God, then everything's going to work out. And I love Samuel's call here because it was bold. It was straight to the part, it was straight to the point, And it was a two-parter. He says this, return to the Lord with all your heart. There was no, <laughs> there was no like, okay, let me put icing on this now. I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings because it is a Sunday morning. Uh, uh, Okay, so there's a thing called sin. It's not a good thing. Uh, But no, he's like, return to the Lord with all your heart. If you return to him with all your heart and you serve him only. It was a two-parter. It wasn't return to him and then also bring your other gods with you. It was return to him, make a clean cut with the world and serve him only. Man, oftentimes, years of lamenting and complaining, you know what it comes from? It comes from issues that you've never truly surrendered to the Lord. This happened to me when I was a child, and it's a horrible thing. And yes, whatever, if someone ever did anything horrible to you as a child, and they ripped something off from you that shouldn't have been ripped off from you, it is a horrible thing. And guess what? You can rest assured that God hates that thing too, but God loves you. You need to surrender that thing to the Lord. 
Well, you know, ever since my divorce, I've never been able to truly be able to devote my life to the Lord because I just feel like a failure. No, stop complaining. Stop spending all your time focused on your problem and the woe is me's of life. We all have them. And return to the Lord and don't bring that with you. We could all go in this room and talk about things where we've been in that spot. Church, I'm there. I've been there in my life. Where we're like, Lord, I would fully go all in and I would want to follow you and I'm having all sorts of problems and my life is so hard. And he's like, come to me. Come to me. And sometimes that's all you have to hear is, okay, I'll follow you. But what they were trying to do with their life was attempting to pacify the issues as we do with the other gods that are in our lives. We pacify with alcohol, drug use, the opposite sex, lust, money, jobs, whatever it is we feel like worshiping because if the time can just scroll away, we can just die and be done with life and not worry about things. But God says, Jesus says, I came to give you life and that more abundantly, not, not you know, life and just you know, go do what you're gonna do with it. No, life in that more abundantly. He came to free you from bondage. He came to free you from sin. He came to give you a new life. He wants you to turn your back on the way you were living and follow him with everything inside of you. Maybe today you're seeking other routes of fulfillment besides the Lord. And if you're doing that, I guarantee you there's a lot more lamenting and complaining in your life because it's easy for us to complain about our problems yet really have no desire in our heart to actually change the things that got us there. It's very true. We can sit there all day and complain about the problems, but yet when there is a way to change it, oh, I just can't do that. We have no desire sometimes to change the things that got us there. But Samuel, he made it abundantly clear. You want, you, you want freedom? You want victory over the Philistines? You want God to come in? You want him to, but you've been cheating on him this whole time. You've been making other gods. You've been doing other things. You've been giving all your attention other, other places. Return to him. And he begins to just speak the truth. Church, that's what we need to do. And that's what my goal is to do, and I'm preaching to myself as well, but if you feel distance from the Lord today, if you feel like you're far away from him, have you allowed the Lord to speak into every dark corner of your heart? Given you 85% of my life, Lord, you can have 30. You know, like whatever it is, you know, for everybody in here, we, you know, I've given you this much and you should be happy, you know? No, that's not the way it works. The Lord's like, but what about all that stuff behind the stuff you just gave me? The anger and resentment towards your family. The anger and resentment towards the way you were raised. The bitterness that you have for other people that have mistreated you. How about you give me that too? Because I wanna do something great. I wanna lead you into victory. I wanna lead you into greatness. And church, today we have the word of God in our hand, but do we have the heart that wants to allow it to change us? I know I've been guilty than all of you times to read the word of God and be like, this is about someone else besides me. And the Lord maybe just said, it's not about someone else, it's about you. Change us completely because that's what will happen. You read this thing day by day, month by month, year by year, you're going to look, talk, act different. And like I said, if you're writing notes in your Bible, you can even look at times where the Lord has come through and remember where you were a year ago. Hebrews 4.12 says the word of God is living, it's powerful, it's sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. 2 Timothy 3.16-17 says all scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, correction, instruction, in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. As you begin to open the word of God, God's word to us, the Holy Spirit begins to minister and to teach you things about your life and about yourself that you didn't even know there. Maybe you don't even know if you're hiding something from the Lord. 
You have hit it so far under a whole bunch of you just burden and you've, you've thrown everything and you're carrying this thing and the Lord's like, no, we just ripped it all off. I want that. Listen, he'll show you things about yourself that you didn't even know existed. He will convict you in ways that you didn't even know you needed convicted. He will exhort you in ways that you didn't know you exhorted. He will, he will encourage you and comfort you and love you because you are his child. But usually when we're off just a little bit in life, it's because our eyes got off of God and onto our problems. Me being the chief of that. When I begin to think like, oh man, this and this, and this is happening, and what about this, and oh, and I can't get sleep, and everything's racing through my brain, and the Lord's like, I've, I've been reminded almost audibly like, this is not what I have planned for you to be up all night stressing about life. This is not that life and more abundantly. You need to spend more time with me. We put too much weight into the grief of the problem. <laughs> the grief of the problem and not 100% of our effort into the sovereignty and the one that can cure the problem. Verses four through six, as we begin to wrap it up and the worship team comes back up, It says, so the children of Israel put away the Baals and the asterisks, and they served the Lord only. You know, that's an amazing verse. verse. Verse four is awesome. They put away the Baals, the asterisks, and they served the Lord only. And Samuel said, gather all Israel to Mitzpah, and I will pray to the Lord for you. So they gathered water together at Mizpah, drew, uh, drew water and poured it out before the Lord. And they fasted that day and they said, we have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the children of Israel at Mizpah. Repentance is more than just hearing about this message, church. Repentance is more than just going, you know what? He's right, you know. You know, like it's more than that. It's going, you know what? There are some things. There's action to repentance. There's action to faith. Gerald talked about living by faith today, but if we have faith in God and he begins to show us this stuff, shouldn't we have faith to let it go? The children of Israel put away the Baals and the asterisks and they began to serve the Lord only. And all these idols that they had begun to creep into their life, you know, I could almost picture him bringing them out going, oh wow, we had quite a few of them. Samuel wasn't lying. Because that's what we are. We're idol factories. We just make them out of everything. There's a new iPhone. Oh, that's all I can think about. There's a new sport. That's all I can think about. Sports are back. That's all I can think about. You know, this guy just retired. That's all I can think about. You know, like every movie, oh, that's all I can think about. You see the trailer 49 times, you know, like that's all we can think about. And the world knows that we want to worship something. And so they give us plenty of stuff to worship when really all of that's supposed to be fulfilled by the Lord. But they did more than just get rid of their idols. They brought them all out. But then they said, yeah. Yep. We have sinned against the Lord, right? They weren't like, okay, you can have our stuff. That's what you want from us. We don't want the Philistines to kill us. It was no, you're right. Take it all. We have sinned against the Lord. They begin to fast. They begin to take their sin against God seriously because true faith leads to actions in our life. And I don't know about you, but there have been times in my life that I have put great hope into faith in certain things only to have that rug pulled out completely underneath me. And God will allow that to happen to you tonight. God allows that to happen to us all the time because after you are on the ground and you're like, oh my goodness, God just shines a spotlight directly onto your heart and just shows you it wasn't what you were looking for. Maybe God tonight has shown you some things that don't belong there. And tonight, if you have a desire to be made fresh and to be made new again, you're tired of lamenting about the same old problem that you've never fully surrendered. You're tired of being troubled. You're tired of being burdened. I want to encourage you to spend this time in worship, to just spend some time sitting there before the Lord in some quiet time and being honest before him. And tonight, if you're like Israel 
and you're like, I, I have sinned, then just tell him, I've sinned against you, Lord. I've brought these things in that shouldn't have been there and they've taken more root than they ever should have. And Lord, I just wanna give them to you and I wanna start fresh and I want you to protect me and I want you to guide me and I want you, to, that closeness. I want, I, I'm taking the step forward, Lord, saying I want to draw near to you. Father, draw near to me. It says that if you draw near to me, I, I, I will draw near to you. If you flee from the enemy, he will flee from you. If you get away from the enemy and say, Lord, I want, no I want nothing to do with that. I just want you. Guess what? He has no power. He will throw all sorts of things in your direction. But if you are in the Lord, the Lord will strengthen you. Notice, notice Samuel said this for him after he's like, I mean, I could just see how excited he was because he's telling him like, yeah, return to the Lord. And who knows with the children of Israel what they're really going to do, right? And as they begin to do it, he's like, now, now, gather together and I'm going to pray for you. Everyone gather together and I'm going to pray for you. And church, let's be a people just like Samuel that can encourage people to follow the Lord, to follow the Lord with everything they have, to put the Lord number one in their life, but also be able to pray for one another, be able to lift one another up in prayer. Because James 5, 16 says, therefore confess your sins to one another, pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. And that was a very easy way to say it, but that's exactly a translation that I thought was good for you tonight. For those of you that this message just rang true tonight, I just wanna give you a chance to just surrender it to him. You know, we're gonna have time of prayer. Uh, my wife and I'll probably up here for the first song, uh, but we'll be out probably in the foyer or vice versa. We might go straight out there. I don't know, we'll see what she wants to do. but. We want to encourage you just to receive prayer. Find someone to pray with. Spend some time before the Lord. We are earlier than we usually are. And just, just be alone with Him. So let's pray. Lord, I just thank you so much, Lord, for uh, you allowing us to get in this spot, Lord. Maybe tonight we came in despondent, not wanting to be here. Father, but we made it anyways, and so we showed up, and we did our thing. We sang our four songs, and then we were like, let's get into the message. But Lord, you rocked us in the message. And Lord, if that is this person in here tonight, whoever they are, with all heads bowed and eyes closed, would you just raise your hand if God spoke to you tonight? Amen. Amen. The Holy Spirit's doing a great work, and so with those people that God is speaking to you, I just want to encourage you to just find that thing and just begin to give it to him in your heart. Begin to surrender it to him. Whether it's, you know, we always think it's, you know, sin and, and these different sins that we can allow in there, but maybe it's just hurt and pain that you haven't given him and he's wanted it, which is sin. So I just pray that whether it's the, the never moving on from the death of a loved one, it's a hard, hard thing to do. But Lord, you have so much life for that person in here tonight. Or it was the person that feels they got the raw end of the deal at a very young age. Father, I just pray that tonight's the night they surrender it and are able to be lifted up, Lord God. Show them the strength in which you've given them through the pain and through the issues and through the problems and Lord that you want to protect them and defend them and Lord that for the first time they could truly give it to you and the weight would fall off their shoulders Lord let the weight fall off their shoulders Lord let there be true repentance let there be true joy let there be true fulfillment let there be everything we speak about Lord God let your Holy Spirit just from each person move in this room right now and so father we give you the glory lord we give you the the power lord we, we give you the credit for anything that you have done in this room anything good that anyone has seen it's from you and of course lord i want to give anyone a chance in here just before we go into this song if someone wants to accept the lord 
and, and you just feel like I just want to give my heart to the Lord right now and maybe you've never done it maybe you did it at church camp when you were 12 you were also super into s'mores and so you didn't really know what you were doing but if you want to give your heart to the Lord tonight I just encourage you just to slip up your hand just a gentle confession that Lord I just wanted to surrender my heart to you tonight amen so church, we're just going to repeat this prayer and I just pray that you'd repeat it after me. Lord Jesus, I do believe that you are the Messiah, that you died on the cross, that you rose again to give me life and that more abundantly. So Lord Jesus, fill me full of your Holy Spirit. Let me surrender all things to you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. If you guys want prayer, like I said, we'll be up here for a little bit and then uh, find someone else to pray with. God bless you.